Okay, get started. Okay. All right. Um, hello. I'm David Solomonoff. I'm the president of the Internet Society of New York, and I'm here uh, today with our panel on what every grid owner needs to know about virtual currencies. And Okay, right, right. And uh, we have, as our panelists, we have um, Alex Kodachnikov, who is an attorney licensed in New York and New Jersey, specializing in bankruptcy, immigration, health care, and regulatory compliance. Also, we have uh, Timothy Rogers, who is the CEO of Zetamex, which is a virtual service network. And he describes himself as a big supporter of Open Simulator as a platform for people to build and create worlds of their own dreams. Also a big open source advocate striving to keep closed source software to a minimum in this platform where the ideal is for the community to develop and make it a better product. Okay. Um, okay. So, basically, uh, the uh, I'll, let me talk briefly a little bit about the Internet Society here and what we're we're doing. Uh, the Internet Society was uh, formed by uh, Internet pioneers Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn uh, to develop open standards for the internet, uh, and uh, the organization has gone to. Uh, advocate more generally for internet freedom and open access and having a um, and, oh okay. uh, a broader mission uh, as I say and big uh, interest in uh, policy issues including uh, economic and legal ones um, I'm having a heavy e echo pro problem here that I need to address here. Right, okay. Right, okay. Sorry, let's see what this does for us. Okay, not helping here. Um, I'm sorry about this. We're having a, a delay issue here. Um, let's, okay, let's see here. Okay, now I'm not hearing myself. That, that's good. Okay, can other people hear me? Uh, excellent. Okay, great. I'm sorry about this. So uh, we're having some audio issues. Okay, so basically uh, the... Uh, I'll be really quick here and then get to the panelists and the good stuff, but uh, basically uh, the internet and cyberspace pre presents a real challenge to traditional political institutions and of course uh, currency is uh, and the controlling the economy, economic activity is an essential part of the modern nation state. So uh, this creates some real uh, interesting issues and conflicts uh, in terms of economic activity in virtual worlds and there have been some changes recently um, uh, as the virtual currencies gain uh, traction so that, for example, there's a lot of concern about issues having to do with money laundering, illegal transactions. Uh, there's a online marketplace called Silk, Silk Road that uses bitcoins and uh, specializes in illegal products and services, particularly illegal drugs. Uh, this is these types of activities are really bringing attracting a lot of attention by, uh, by governments and law enforcement. So naturally, that uh, impacts uh, other kinds of econ economic activities in virtual worlds as well. And we've recently seen 
uh, some developments there in terms of restrictions in terms of uh, virtual currency so that uh, Second Life uh, is restricting the resale of their uh, Linden, uh, Linden dollars um, and uh, there are other kinds of issues there. Uh, so um, first uh, I'm going to throw this open over to uh, uh, Alex and uh, ask him to give us an overview on what's going on with these new rules and restrictions. Again, Second Life uh, changing rules for third-party exchanges, Kitely uh, moving towards a, a fictional or closed loop uh, type of currency. And the final question is, what, how does this affect grid owners? What should they know about the changing rules? And also, how are international grids affected? So, Alex, give us your uh, viewpoint on all this. Thank you, Dave. Um, thanks, everybody, for having me and uh, hearing me out. Like Dave mentioned, I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of where regulations stand right now with, um, with virtual currency. In, um, in March of this year, the Financial Industry Regulating Agency, they are the, basically the enforcer of uh, financial institutions, they issued a guidance statement for people who deal with virtual currencies. A guidance statement is not, is not exactly a rule. It's not really law yet. It's like it's something that lets them apply existing laws to a new issue. So in this instance, they applied the laws that apply to money services businesses and money transmitters to people who deal with virtual currency. In this guidance, they made a, they, well, they tried to make a distinction between the users of virtual currency and exchanges and, and administrators. They are saying that users are basically anybody who who uses virtual currency just like real currency. For example, you buy goods and services with it. At the same time, administrators and exchangers are people who accept virtual currency and sell it for living or otherwise. If you can imagine, the definition is kind of convoluted. Well, that's partly because uh, it's so new. The whole issue of virtual currency is so new to them. FinCEN being a regulating agency, they don't really like to stay in the darkness, so that's why they came up with this guidance. It's, it's more or less a way for them to gather information. One of the things that I personally didn't like about this, uh, the guidance is that they made, they made the, the currency laws apply to people who deal with virtual currency through the, the definition of a money transmitter. The reason I didn't like it is because there were uh, if uh, people who were who were dealing with virtual currencies were dealt with through uh, were dealt with as dealers in foreign exchange, this would have been a lot better. But the reason they came out with the um, with the money transmitter definition as opposed to the dealer in foreign exchange is because of the enforcement capabilities. If a person doesn't uh, register with the state authority as a money transmitter, there's possible criminal penalties. There were a few reactions to the to FinCEN guidance. One of the first ones who uh, who reacted officially to uh, US government dealing with virtual currencies was uh, Second Life. And the first thing Second Life did was ban the third party resellers. That lasted about 10 days because they, uh, I guess, people got up in arms about that. Uh, and 10 days later, Second Life changed its stance and said that now third-party resellers, they can't cash out anybody. All they, all they can do is sell the Linden dollar. I don't think that changes anything for the third-party resell, resellers. They would still have to be registered with, the, with, with FinCEN. But I think it, it makes things a little easier for the user. So, some of the latest developments in this area of virtual currency is that, that uh, in the United States, the state regulators have started jumping on the bandwagon of, uh, of regulating. For example, New York came out with, um, with its own guidance of how it thinks uh, virtual currency should be regulated. The good thing about it is that it, uh, in its guidance, 
it hinted that it'll come up with a whole new set of guidance for virtual currencies because if current money transmitter rules are applied to virtual currency dealers, it'll cost them a whole lot of money. Uh, what I mean by a whole lot of money is by the current rules, everybody who's a money transmitter has to put up a bond, a half a million dollar bond. As you can imagine, that's pretty expensive for somebody who's uh, who doesn't have a large income from what they're doing. How how does all of the all the virtual currency guidance applies to international people who deal with interna with virtual currency internationally, for example, who own grids internationally? It's confusing, to say the least. Right now, there's a, there's a statute on the books that says uh, everybody who, who's a money transmitter, no matter where they are, they have to register with, with FinCEN and the state, uh, state regulators. Oh, can I interrupt? That would be, in the United States, that would mean uh, potentially every state you would have to be registered with. Am I getting that correct? Yeah, every every state where you where you're dealing with virtual currencies, where you sell in yeah. virtual currency, right? That that would be right. Mm -hmm. So that's very very difficult for a small grid owner, or not, for rather a small currency exchange, when the actual amount of uh, of uh, you know transact the actual amount of the transactions is still fairly small. It's very big barrier to entry at all. Am I understanding that right? Yeah, you got it right. I mean, like yeah. I said, the, the silver lining is all of this is that New York is not doing anything right now as far as making people who deal with virtual currency put up a, a half a million dollar bond. They are kind of taking the wait and see approach and they are mm -hmm. saying that we'll just uh, we'll get the reactions, we'll see the comments from the industry and we'll, uh, we'll play it by ear. We'll make more concrete rules uh, in regards to virtual currency when we get some, uh, some reaction to all of this. Mm -hmm. That's what the, the gist of all of this is. Okay, great. Okay, uh, right. So let's uh, go over to Tim now. And um, can you give us kind of an overview of the options that are available to grid owners, kind of the pro, uh, pros and cons of different ways of uh, having uh, financial transactions on, you know, in your, your, your world? Well, yes, actually, I was going to share a couple of these and uh, briefly go over the, your different options and the things that you should consider before choosing one of the options. Mm -hmm. So, things you need to consider is, do you want control over the currency? Because there's a couple of different options out there for grids to choose whether that they want to have full control over their currency or rather have another company such as Verox, which is a long, well-standing company, or First Meta, which is also another long-standing currency exchange. Um, the next one is, what are your payment options your business and or country can accept? This is something I've run into a lot, being in my line of work. There's a lot of customers who come to me and they say, I can't do PayPal because I live in such and such country and PayPal does not work in my country. So that is another thing you have to take into consideration when you're choosing to do a currency. And then lastly, are you interested in having a live or a play currency? The control no, and oh, go ahead. Yeah, do you want to clarify the difference between the live and the play currency there? Yeah, I've actually got a couple slides here that I go, I'm going to answer all these questions. This was just that was just a brief overview of what I'm going to cover in these coming slides. Just a couple short slides here. Mm -hmm. All right. So in the control and currency, um, PayPal is amazing, but as I said already, of my past experiences that. It only works in so many countries. I have had the lovely chance of speaking with a company of Burrox and First Meta Exchange, which used to be very popular working with Second Life. However, with the new changes, they were no longer allowed to stay within Second Life some system. But that being said, that they are willing to work with OpenSim Grids. I have spoken with them, and they are more than happy to work with anyone who's willing to work with them. Uh, the advantages of working with them is one you don't have to worry about too much of the on you burden whereas it they handle all your money and I'll explain some advantages and disadvantages of that here in a moment um, and then lastly 
letting companies like Burrox and PayPal handle your currency versus you handling it directly. All right, the difference between lab and play. Well, if you're wanting to have a fictitious currency, um, best examples of grids that want to do a fictitious currency are those who want to, you know, if you're an educational grid, give um, currency to people for doing tasks, um, training exercises with rewards, or if you're just doing a little gaming grid or well, currencies that have absolutely no real world cash value. These are common examples of wanting to do a more like play-like currency, which means the money has no real-world value. Mm -hmm. Whereas then with a the live currency, um, you have currency exchange, you have the supply and demand. Some grids, of which I see a lot with OpenSim grids, they have a fixed exchange where one U.S. dollar would equal anywhere between 250, whatever their credit currency is called, or 300 of their credit currency. Um, some grids have a buy-in only, such as Kitely, which is the one that's most known right now, where you can just buy in, but they don't have the ability to cash out. A lot of these other grids still offer that. Getting into the top three, I've put some Bitly addresses in here. I've tried to make them super simple. If you want to find out more information about them, you can see them up on the slideshow. It's right underneath the screenshot of that site. The uh, first one that is most popular is Mod PayPal. This is um, by, I hope I do not butcher her name, or his name, Snoopy Peffer. This is the owner of Dreamland Metaverse, also 3D world hosting company, one of the largest three. Um, the I, I judge the setup of this one for anybody to be intermediate. The tutorial is right on the GitHub, which you can get to right from here. The interface works directly with PayPal, meaning when you perform a transaction, the grid owner doesn't have any ability to directly earn from it. When somebody buys something or tries to sell something, it goes straight through PayPal, bypassing any chance for a grid owner to make a profit from it. When I say a grid owner doesn't have the ability to make a direct profit from it, I mean in the sense of an OS, well not OS grid, but in Second Life, when you buy Lindens or you cash out Lindens, you have this exchange rate and then you have a fee. Um, Second Life will charge you a fee and this is how grids can make some extra money based on the fees they charge for the buying and selling of currency. With the mod PayPal function you can't do that because the currency is handled directly by PayPal. Then your next biggest option, the one that is the second largest that I see so many grids use and want to, want to run with is OMC, Open Metaverse Currency. This is maintained mostly by Grand's University of Technology. However, Burrox is the people who handle the money transactions, but all the development is handled by Grand's University of Technology. This is the most simple one to implement. However, it does require you to send a couple emails to Grand's, user, Grand's University of Technology in order to make sure you can get the setup and they can move you over from the test system to the live system. It's super simple to install. They, it's You drop in a couple lines into your configuration file, drop in a two DLL files, and start up your simulator like normal. Super simple. You, they are the largest. They accept Bitcoin, PaySafe cards, Skrill, PayPal. This, this one, uh, one of the biggest things people have always said, though, with OMC is you have to confirm every transaction on a web page. Now this is something that a lot of people don't know and I want to bring this up is they have a new feature that's been around for a while so it's not really new but at the time that OMC came available no one, they didn't have that feature but they're not really good at advertising that they have this feature but they have something called pocket money. What pocket money is if you do use OMC in your grid to avoid your residents actually having to go and confirm every transaction on a web page, everyone in your grid can go log into their web account and say, I want to move so much of my currency to my pocket. And what your pocket is, is a set amount of money you're willing to have on hand in the world before it actually requires you to start confirming transactions again. It's a great way for users to not have to complain about the annoyance of I just want to pay this person 1L, but I have to go through the whole click, confirm, 
confirm again on the web page, enter my password. Yes, I do want to send it. It's a bypass for that. But again, with this currency, you don't, the grid owner has no ability to directly earn from it because, again, this is going straight through Verox's money exchange and not the grid owner. Oh, yeah. Can I just ask to clarify there? So the pocket money, uh, the grid owner cannot, uh, you know, take a piece of or have a commission or a service fee for that. But money uh, transactions that are not pocket money they can did i understand that correctly actually any transactions that happen with the omc you, the grid owner has no access to it at all not with the pocket money or the not pocket oh. money the only okay. advantage of pocket money is for users to avoid having to confirm every single transaction on a web page uh, this is great for security especially over the hypergrid because we all, I know a lot of people, if you ever come from Second Life, those scripts you res out and you click on it, and then all of a sudden all your linden's gone. Having that confirm on a web page was their advantage to bypassing people doing malicious scripts and open sim. But mm -hmm. it's very annoying for people to have to confirm every transaction on a web page so they introduce pocket money, which is where you can set aside money to be accessed without a web page needed. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, and then my last one, which is the largest, is DTL NSL Money Server. Granted, I don't know what the NSL stands for, but the DTL is for decentralized. It's a money server system that runs parallel to the OpenSIM process. This is the only one where you are directly in control, and it is the most popular. Now, noting what we've just heard from our legal advice here a lot of grids might want to double take about using this now I know a lot of them have built off of this currency but you can also use this currency as a play currency or a live currency essentially this currency let me give you a little bit of back history really quick it's maintained by Tokyo University of Information Sciences in Japan the web page looks a little scary when you get there, but they have a button in the top left that says English, and they do have an English version of the entire site, so don't freak out too much. And they have a forum. They do speak English. They're very kind. Uh, they were very helpful to me. They are very awesome. The setup is intermediate because you do have to download a bunch of files. You have to do a lot of configuration, but this gives you full control of your currency you have every ability that you want. You can do it as a play currency, set it up where you only give people money when the task, as I explained earlier, or you can set it up to do live, act it as a live currency. Now, there is no built-in system that says PayPal, if somebody pays this PayPal so much, it generates that money, but they have scripts with detailed tutorials teaching people how to set those things up. But the reason they don't have those connected is mainly because of what you just heard from Alex over here. Is if they do that, then they can risk that ability of being held slightly liable just for offering it all bundled together. So that really concludes what I was presenting today. And I hope if y'all have any questions, this last slide, uh, there, there's tutorials on this at the Zatara website. It's the news section, and we're going to be having more. And if you have any more questions, you can contact me at my email address up there, me at timothyfrancisrogers.me. I'd be happy to help anyone to do the best site, to the best ability I can with currency. But I can't make any promises because you never know what's going to happen with OpenSIM technology. It's always changing. I'll hand it back to you. Okay. Um, yeah, just, uh, so basically, uh, I'm going to throw this out to everybody, to, to both of you here. Um, what we're really seeing now is, is a situation where live, what you would call live currencies are much more going to be looking like they're going to be much more heavily regulated and grid owners really need to be very aware of that in a way that wasn't the case before. Uh, and, uh, basically a situation where uh, offloading some of the management uh, and uh, 
the administration uh, has a you know much that's much more valuable now uh, of a service than it was in the past. Would I'm throwing that out to both of you if you, to respond? Yeah, I think I'll um, I'll try. Well, right. I I think that uh, actually registering with uh, with FinCEN and, and complying with the regulations is not that hard. I mean, if you look at all of the like, for example, you know, in the real world, the check cash in places, yeah. they are all registered with both uh, the federal regulators and the state regulators. I mean, they are essentially their mom and pop shops, and they are compliant. They don't have law departments doing that so it's really not that hard right now to use the example of uh, you know uh, I work in a, a poor in my day job a poor part of, of Brooklyn where there are a lot of check, check cashing places but of course there you physically go to the check cashing place and cash your payroll check let's say and that all happens in Brooklyn though you know, the check might be from someplace else. That's a lot more localized than uh, tra transactions in uh, virtual worlds. So there are more complexities there in terms of the fact that people uh, who partake of a, a transaction uh, could be on any part of the, uh, anywhere on the planet. Uh, and that creates a lot more complexity there. Am I right about that? Um, yes and no. Okay. In a way, in a way, the what the rules that both people in the virtual worlds and in the real world, the rules that they have to comply with, they're they're essentially the same. So what it what it does is, if there's a, if an owner of a check cash in place sees a, a suspicious check, and the way the rules classify a suspicious check is anything over ten thousand dollars, I believe, some something in, in that amount. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. That same amount would apply in virtual world as well. So it doesn't really matter where the check is coming from. It's more it's more the amounts that they're dealing with and other things that that may seem off about a transaction. I, I do understand that in the virtual in, in the virtual world it may be a little harder to distinguish what will be off about the transaction. But yes, right. You know, it's still a work in progress even for the regulators. Right, right. To use uh, that example, uh, it's in a virtual world or in cyberspace, it's very easy to automate things where your large illicit transaction could be broken down uh, into a number of smaller transactions that could be quickly, you know, uh, handled to for effectively the same effect uh, there. Whereas in the real world, to go to you know many different cashing check cashing places, uh, you know, with different checks, uh, that physically would be very difficult. But again. In cyberspace, you can do that much more easily, which creates different challenges in terms of um, illicit, illicit or fraudulent uh, transactions. Yeah, I can't, okay. can't argue with that. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, Tim, uh, you want to give us uh, your perspective here? Uh, as I said, I, I don't, well, as I said before, the conversation got just started. I, I'm really not able to comment too much on the legal side of things. It's really yeah. outside of my realm. Uh -huh. um, okay. I, but I do want to say that I in the earlier question that you proposed, I do think this does scare a lot of more people who are up and coming with grids that they're probably going to rely on services such as First Meta Exchange or OMC just because that fear of needing that money backing. I mean, I didn't even know about that till today and it's, it's kind of a scary thought of needing so much money when your grid would probably never even come close to that for your first right. maybe two or three years even if that right. right right it will somebody proposed a question for questions from the audience I don't know if you can see that all the way back there uh, um, or if you can see the questions from the audience I can see them in the local chat here I do want to address one from address I, I kind of addressed it in local while y'all are talking but uh, to answer you in more detail address um, I can offer you some tutorials and guides on how to actually install it, but as far as actually getting it set up and working for OMC, you'll need to actually contact Grand University as they are the ones who can activate it. All I can help is guide you through the actual setup procedure. Okay. Okay. Uh, other questions? So far, if you'll have questions, post them in local and 
and I'm sure one of one two of us. If it's if it's a more techie question, maybe I I'll probably be able to answer it. If it's a more legal question, I'm sure Alex would be more than happy to. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Maria has a question. Uh, the question is: Will grids eventually go closed loop, non refundable currencies? Um, I personally don't think so. Like like I said earlier, it's not. Uh, it's really not that difficult to register, and even uh, at least with the federal government, you don't have to spend a lot of money a year to comply with them, uh, especially if you're a small a small business owner, because the, there's a little there's a lot of uh, drawbacks to closed loop currencies as opposed to open loop. Essentially, the virtual currency gives gives the grid owner um, ability to control the economy, whereas uh, a closed loop is it's basically a gift card, so mm-hmm. I don't think Second Life or any grid owner will want to deprive themselves of that of that ability. But that's a business decision. Yeah, the uh, I'm gonna step in and just point out that uh, a live currency means that um, the trans, you know, that uh, basically that you can sell something in a virtual world and take the proceeds and go and buy something in the physical world uh, and that is a huge advantage that and that area that's where the virtual and the uh, you know traditional nation state uh, economies uh, start to merge which is a very interesting and challenging thing but it has pre- tremendous opportunities for grid owners if they they have a popular grid and and there are a lot of transactions there they can take that and directly you know, uh, use that wealth in, in the real world. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, to answer that question, uh, um, Dirk, um, I think if what you're asking is, is it possible to put it in one place and pull it out elsewhere? I don't know if you're talking about like a specific module or if you're talking. Because I know in the senses, let's say, for example, OMC. OMC actually works over the hypergrid. Um, so essentially, if you were, say, you hypergraded here and one of these regions had OMC enabled and you had so many OMC in your wallet and, say, you bought something from one of the stores here, that money would then transfer to a grid owner here. Um, then you would that person who's selling the object here would go into the site and cash it out. Uh, this is like a vendor selling something. I put currency in, getting something from the vendor, and takes out my dinner. Well, yeah, I mean, that, I guess, essentially what he was saying in a closed currency is something like a gift card. I guess, um, I know Kiteley, it seems like Kiteley's gone towards that area, whereas you buy in their currency, but you can't cash it out. I've I've heard them speak a couple times. I don't know if they've actually gotten anyone to do it yet, but where you, they're going to eventually have another company offer cashing out, but it will not be through them. But as far as I know now, they don't ever plan on doing it themselves. Dirk, also uh, to answer your question, one currency that I can think of that that does that is Bitcoin, and that was. Yeah. I think really why why the regulators decided to step in because it, it's so easy to move it around. I mean, the yeah. reason uh, like the reason uh, business owners or even merchants who now accept PayPal, the reason some of them love it is because the cost of transaction is so negligible. It's like it's in the fraction of, of a cent. Mm-hmm. But it certainly does what uh, does what you are saying. You can put it in in one place, take it out in at the other end of the world, and it's it's really easy. That's what it was. It was designed to do. Well, I want to answer this and then toss it right back to Alex. But um, Second Life didn't make third-party exchanges illegal. They just changed how it works. Um, just to reiterate what he was telling us, because this was something I actually investigated myself. Third parties can no longer exchange your money other than to purchase Lindens, they can no longer cash out your Lindens. It's more of a reseller program in a sense for them now. For example, if you were to buy Lindens from Verox, you would end up purchasing, um, let's say you purchase a PaySafe card from your local store in your country, and then you go to Verox.com and you use that to purchase. You no longer have that ability to go in world and say, I have a thousand Linden, I want to cash it out to my PayPal, 
you can't do that anymore, but you can still purchase, but you can no longer export. And that's the only thing that they changed. They didn't make it illegal. They just changed the rules for third-party currency exchanges. I mean, Alex can add more to that if he wants. Yeah, I think the reason they they did that was that they tried to limit the amount of third-party exchanges that they had. They had a lot more third-party exchanges before they made uh, they made the rule change. The reason they want to limit it is uh, it probably it it makes compliance a little easier. That's why I mean they are they are a big company, so they have to they have to keep track of what they do in light of the recent changes. Right. And I also want to point out, just so people are aware, just as when Maria pointed this out before, in the event of Worlds Inc., when the patent was made for virtual worlds, there is also a patent for microcurrencies, such as the Linden Exchange and whatnot, and I have to look back in their work cases, where Linden Labs did have to pay royalties for that patent, so that is another thing to look out for if you get big and somebody decides that company who owns the patent decides to do something and make you pay that royalty to use it just a heads up in that location uh -huh. um, okay and what uh, situations uh, would somebody have to pay royalties uh, on the patents to, uh, to, to clarify that a little bit uh, to, to clarify, um, well, I think Alex can probably clarify what a patent is better than I can. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really can't. Uh, okay, well... And, and even though, I, I mean, uh, uh, you know, even even some courts can't clarify what a patent is, so it's, it's a yeah, really... Patents support. are really the gray area, and I really think they have good intentions, but I think they're broken. Yeah. Essentially, what a patent is supposed to do is say, I have an idea. I want it protected from anyone else using it. And then it grants you the right to say, well, that was my idea. I patented it. Now you have to pay me royalties. But you don't have to pay those royalties unless that person decides to say, you're using it. That's my idea. If they don't, yeah. in a sense, catch you doing it, and if and I know that's not the right words, but in a sense, they don't yeah. catch you doing it. You really, you're fine. Yeah. And they normally only go after big people that they know they're going to win money from. Yeah, they normally go off the deep pockets, basically. Because <laughs> right. if, if they're going to sue some small grid owner, they know they're like, well, probably the best I'm going to get out of them is like 100 or so bucks. And that's not really a lot for them, so right. it's not worth it their time. Court fees would be higher. Right. Yeah, that, that's when it well, that's when it pays to be judgment proof. Judgment proof is is a nice word uh, to describe a person with no money. <laughs> yeah, there are ways that uh, patent trolls, that is, uh, companies and individuals that specifically, uh, rather than developing technology, just strictly uh, use litigation re regarding patents to as their business model, uh, will go after, uh, you know. So they have a way of going after the, the easiest targets to set a precedent and then shaking down uh, you know, people with more money. But uh, this is really in you know, violation of really the original uh, belief or the original intention of the framers of our Constitution in terms of, of patents. The idea was there are things like patents and copyrights being a way to incentivize innovation for a period of time before things went back into the public domain or what, what we might call now open source. And uh, there are really uh, a lot of people feel that there's a real major kind of pat uh, patent reform is necessary uh, to continue to foster innovation rather than inhibit it. But that's a, probably a topic for another conversation. Um, I do uh, want to, oh, sorry. Yeah. I, we yeah, just got go another ahead. question, and I I don't know if you see it in local, Alex. I, yeah, I, I see right. it. Uh, I can I, I answer think, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Chris, the answer to your question is if you're making virtual items, you don't need to register with uh, with any U.S. agency. It's just it, it's a product just like anything else. If you are uh, selling those same virtual items for virtual currency, and then you're cashing it out, or rather using it to pay somebody else, then it's uh, it's a murky area so far. Um, right, I would right. say yes on the safe side, but uh, it's kind of a gray area at this point since you're in Canada. 
Okay. I'm sorry for interrupting you there. It was just that okay. question oh. popped up. I want to make sure we got whoever. Okay. 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 We're uh, kind of coming down the home stretch now. So what I'd like to do is ask both uh, uh, Tim and Alex, uh, in either order, uh, to kind of wind it up with their final thoughts, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, Tim? Okay, well, I'll go first then. Um, my final thoughts on this whole thing, I, I learned a lot. I mean, me coming here today, I, did, I knew there was a lot of different changes, but I didn't realize a lot until I heard it from Alex. So I even learned something attending today. Um, I do think it's it adds to the scare factor, but I think it's right. not a huge deal at the mo I think it's a huge deal, yes. But I'm thinking for a lot of these smaller grids, I see them migrating to using these tools that I've shown today in the presentation like OMC and Mon PayPal because it keeps the money out of their hands. It makes them feel a little more secure about dealing with having a virtual currency in their world. Um, I think that we're not really going to see a change so much in our worlds because I think I think we might see some people operating illegally now, just because they probably don't know these law changes and whatnot. And hopefully they get the knowledge and they can get the resources they need. I'm definitely going to inform clients who end up ordering services from me with currencies that are out of my control that they might want to consider these laws and make sure they're in compliance before they go through with it, but I don't think we're going to see too much of it affecting the open sim world, just because at the moment the open sim world seems to still remain more free as to oppose a paid place as Second Life and In-Worlds, but that's just from my perspective. Okay. Okay. Uh, Alex? Yeah, uh, first of all, Thanks everybody for uh, for being here. Uh, thanks, thank you to Tim and Dave for uh, for I learned a lot from you guys today. Um, I think the the legal side of this issue it's still developing. It, it'll likely be developing for the next few years. Uh, I mean, it'll laws are always changing, especially on uh, on a tech subject. But it's not. All in all, it's not that scary. I mean, to for a for a small grid owner to register with uh, with FinCEN, it doesn't it doesn't take a lot. It doesn't take a lot of time, and it also it doesn't it takes almost no money. So just follow what uh, follow the legal climate out there, and just don't be afraid. Okay, great. Okay, thanks everybody for a fantastic presentation on a you know breaking topic here. Uh, as a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. And I believe in this room, the next session will be viewers and open simulator. Uh, will be the topic of the panel with Justin Clark Casey, Cinder Biscus, and LaRue Fairs. And thanks again to our speakers and the audience. And uh, we'll soon have another session. Thanks a lot. Bye.